Hello, and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am Scott Goldfine, your host, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One, The First Guide to Funk. If you don't have your copy, get on over to Amazon and pick one up. You'll be so glad you did. Whether you're watching or listening, as always, I thank you so much for continued interest and support. This episode features guitarist, singer, composer, producer Thomas McClary, a founder and leading creative force behind the Commodores, which was not just one of the best and most successful funk R&B bands of the 1970s, but by the end of that decade, one of the biggest pop groups in the world. While it was lead singer Lionel Richie who had become the best known Commodore and a solo superstar, it was McClary who first recruited Richie during their college days at Alabama's Tuskegee University and helped transform him into a frontman. The pair joined with the other four principals and signed to Motown Records in 1972. As a self-contained band, it marked a departure for the Barry Gordy-founded Detroit label, so famous for its assembly line factory approach of using lots of specialists to generate hit songs. Although it would not be until two years later when the Commodore's debut album, Machine Gun, would drop, under the guidance of producer James Carmichael, they hit the ground running as the album contained a pair of R&B hits and I Feel Sanctified and the title instrumental Machine Gun that continued to be in demand for television and film soundtracks. The album was the first of five in a row that saw the Commodores progressing higher up the quality and stardom uh, ladder with each successive release. Those next four albums were 1975's Caught in the Act, then Moving On, then Hot on the Tracks, and then the Commodore's self-titled album, or as many called it because of its cover, The Blue Album. The hits and timeless classics on those records included Slippery When Wet, This Is Your Life, Sweet Love, Gimme My Mule, Fancy Dancer, Just To Be Close To You, High On Sunshine, Brick House, Easy, Zoom, and Funky Situation. At this point, the Commodores were a superstar act, and they continued to score on the singles charts with hits like too Hot to Trot, Three Times a Lady, Just to Be Close to You, Sail On, Still, Old Fashioned Love, Lady Who Bring Me Up, and Oh No. By the time internal friction splintered the group in the early 1980s, causing first Richie to go his separate way, and shortly followed by McClary, the Commodores had amassed 16 top 40 pop hits, six top 20 pop albums, and during one stretch, they notched four straight number one R&B albums. The Commodores created some of the 20th century's greatest and most enduring funk, soul, and pop. McClary, who has billed himself as the first Commodore and released his autobiography last year called Rock and Soul, lays claim to being the architect of what he calls the group's signature sound. Here, in an in-depth and candid discussion, he talks about that sound, as well as how the group was formed, how it rose to the height of fame, how the wheels came off, and how despite some bitter infighting, he continues to hold out hope of reunion. Plus, aside from the music, McClary is a fascinating figure and family man who recounts his experiences as a child, being one of the first African-American students to integrate the Florida school system. I found him to be a smart, funny, and highly engaging gentleman loaded with incredible stories. I gotta tell you, you've tuned in for an exceptional truth and rhythm, so enjoy. It is my distinct honor to welcome to Truth and Rhythm guitarist, singer, composer, producer, Thomas McClary, a founding member of one of the best and most successful funk R&B pop bands of all time, the great Commodores. He's also an author with his autobiographical book, Rock and Soul, having been released last fall. So wonderful to have you, Thomas. How's it going? Oh, really good. Scott, uh, it's a pleasure. You know, I was anticipating talking to you today. And uh, as I, you know, got a little inside info on you and the slipper went wet. <laughs> <laughs> You're a slipper went wet fan, which is, you know, uh, I love to hear that. <laughs> uh, we were, um, funny thing about that song, Slipper Went Wet. Um, we would play Madison Square Garden um, and Mick Jagger would, you know, come to our sound checks. And 
and um, he he told Lionel and I when, once he says, uh, you know, "Slipper When Wet" <laughs> is the song that the Rolling Stones would use as a part of their sound check, <laughs> their sound check. So I was yeah. flattered to to um, to have um, obviously you know. Mick Jagger and the Stones playing one of my songs, even even in soundcheck. You know? yeah, so, so you had maybe Keith Richards playing your riff. There you go. Wow, nice. <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah. I just I love that track. We'll talk about it a little more when we get to that album. But um, as I told you, it hooked me back when I was I think in junior high. But um, from then on, man, I was I was in I was in with the Commodores. So. Well, Scott, I, I looking at you, I didn't think you were old enough to know about the Commodores, but hey, you know. <laughs> well, thanks. I, I wouldn't think you're old enough to be in the Commodores. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> looking good. So um, so where are you coming to us from today, Thomas? I'm in Orlando. Just got back from Los Angeles uh, where we um, uh, continuing my book tour, the Rock and Soul. Um, so, you know, I'm a little jet lag, but I said, Hey, no, nah, I gotta do this. <laughs> <laughs> Much appreciated. So, sure. uh, well, I want to jump right into it, you know, but get some, some background on, on the great Thomas McClary all the way back, you know, where, where were you from originally Thomas? And did you come up in a musical household? What was it like growing up in the McClary's household? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, I, I'm i originally from a small town, Eustis, Florida, and I grew up in a household of eight. It was uh, four boys and four girls, and we were all two years apart, and my parents were musically inclined, and so I grew up with instruments all around me. Uh, my older brother, Samuel, played every single instrument, so you know, um, he was obviously the, the, the guru who influenced me uh, initially. And um, I got started actually playing the ukulele. That was my first instrument. So I guess I can attribute some of my strumming style as, on the guitar from my days as a ukuleleist. <laughs> and of course, um, I was the first African-American to integrate the public school in my uh, county back in uh, the, the early 60s when the civil rights movement was a, was a formidable during that time. And I happened to have, um, it was a watershed moment for me actually, because I was a fan of, of Dr. King and Jackie Robinson. And as I looked at the news every day and uh, witnessed some of the racial uh, slurs and some of the cross burnings and from the Klan and some of the um, things that were happening on television uh, in other states, I actually witnessed a lot of that in my own hometown, but I was determined to um, integrate the school and because that the school was literally blocks away from my house and I had to go uh, catch a bus to go on the other side of town uh, to the school that I was attending at the time. And so, uh, to actually uh, survive and, and endure some of that, it actually played an important role in my grit and it just kind of gave me fuel. And I thought, man, if I could survive two years of having a rock strewn at you and um, literally your sweater being burnt while you're wearing it, and still manage to um, coexist and, and, and bring about a peaceful environment. Um, it was uh, a wake-up call for me. And as I 
uh, graduated and went to Tuskegee, Alabama, I was, um, and I talk about this in my book, Rock and Soul, too, by the way. I, um, as I got to Tuskegee, Alabama, thinking, okay, now, great, I'm in an all black school, and, you know, I have gone through this thing of integrating um, an all white school, only to find out that um, there were some pictures there as well uh, with, um, uh, George Wallace being the, the governor, and um, we had, uh, I was a, an engineering major, and the engineers were complaining about some of the instructors not being, um, speaking English very well, they, and they um, decided that uh, the administrators weren't listening to them, so they decided they were going to hold the trustees hostage. <laughs> and come to find out, one of the trustees was uh, was the president was the son of uh, the president of Coca Cola. So he called George Wallace, and next thing we know, the troops are on the campus, and you know the students started to protest also because. There was a gentleman named uh, Samuel Young who had just gotten killed the year before I got there because he, he had gone into an all white bathroom. So I'm standing in the registration line now. I'm thinking, oh my God, did I pick the right school? So I hear this guy whistling a song by Eddie Harris uh, called Listening Here. And um, Eddie Harris is a jazz saxophonist. And so I turned and I said, uh, are you a musician? And this guy was very shy, you know, he, he kind of looked down. He says, no, I'm not really. I said, well, man, you know, I'm, I'm trying to find some musicians because I want to be, you know, on the talent show for the freshman talent show. And um, just to kind of get my mind settle here in, you know, um, he says, well, if you could meet me, I live here in Tuskegee. If you meet me at my grandmother's where I live across the streets from the campus, I'll round up some guys for you to audition. And then, it, you know, maybe you can put, put a band together from that uh, audition. This guy was Lionel Richie. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so, there we we are on our mission to um, audition, and then he comes down the stairway playing a saxophone, and I'm like, I thought you said you weren't a musician. <laughs> he says, Oh well, you know, I play a little bit. I said, Okay, you're in the band. So um, the watershed moment for me was when my uh, parents said to me, you know, if you decide that you're going to go and integrate the school, we're going to support you. Now, we can do one of two things. We can walk you to the school and, you know, baby you or take you to the school and try to camp around the campus. and Or we can say, okay, son. This is your moment, like the Eagles do, go fly. So I, it was that same momentum, because I had a band called the Matadors in high school mm -hmm. that I wanted to pursue my music. And it was, um, I knew that um, even from uh, when I was like, six or seven years old, I would have these dreams and aspirations of being on stage. And I would go and visit uh, and see some of the gospel acts that, you know, like um, um, the, the blind boys or the soul stirs and, mm -hmm. and the guitar that they used in, the, in their presentation. It was always attractive to me. 
and uh, of course um, uh, Chuck Berry, Jimi Hendrix, you know, B.B. King were all um, obviously um, huge. I was huge fans. So, and so as I met Lionel Richie, my opening statement to him was, you know, I'm going to put this band together and we're going to be the Black Beatles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and of course, he looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> well, that's, well, that's a lot, that's that's a lot, lot of history, history right there. Right Pretty amazing. Um, yeah, it's, it's just all in my book, though. And I just kind of just want to give you a quick overview. Um, the book is um, we're, we're going to do a movie based on the book. So it is a really uh, a powerful story, um, according to some of the executives that are excited about doing the movie. Uh, well, congratulations to you on, on the book and also that opportunity. Well deserved. Thank you, Scott. So you connected with uh, Lionel, that magic, uh, you know, uh, fateful, whatever you want to call it, uh, meetup that you guys had. And um, how did how did the band then get fleshed out? And you know, when did you first start getting out and, and really kind of performing? Well, our first performance was the talent show, and because, like I said, Lionel was very shy, and the other guys that. Uh, apparently, uh, it was uh, Offer Hines on the bass, Lana was on the sax, uh, excuse me, uh, Andre Callahan was on the drums, and I was on the guitar. And of course, when the curtains opened up, everybody went behind the curtains except me and the drummer. <laughs> so, it's, Tuskegee is being a small campus, but it was 4,000 students, and that was a lot if you had not performed live in front of an audience. So we went from the band being shy, basically, to face an audience, to opening up for the Jackson 5. But obviously, there was a, um, you know, uh, of some coverage that we had to uh, kind of to get to evolve to that to that stage mm -hmm. and of course um, after we won the, the talent show it kind of gave guys a little incentive you know like wow you know they really liked us in fact um, after they started applauding you know uh, introduced the guys they came out from behind the curtains <laughs> and uh, of course you know, not to get peanuts thrown on you and just, just you know, the actual applaud. It was a, it was a breath of fresh air. You know? What were you guys playing? Oh, we played um, uh, Cold Sweat by James oh, Randall. Nice. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, uh, we played a, a little bit of Tobacco Road. Um, and uh, we wanted to do... Uh, just a slight medley, you know. So it was a cold sweat, tobacco road, and then um, we did a little bit of Archibald and the Drells tighten up. <laughs> and who was mostly doing the vocals at that point? At that point, uh, we had uh, a young lady who did the initial vocals. Uh, she was my roommate's girlfriend. And um, she sang Tobacco Road. And, and of course, um, Offer Hines, who was on the bass, he, he did the little James Brown, you know, uh, squealing and stuff. And then afterwards, after the talent show, Sorry about that. I really was trying to find some instruments, you know, permanently because I had borrowed the uh, uh, guitar from a young man who was in another band called the Jays, and the Jays was um, um, it broken up basically not because of any infighting or anything, but uh, some of the members just graduated, and um, you know, we thought it would be a good idea if I could 
find these guys and maybe merge the two bands together because <clears throat> we didn't have any real equipment and they had all of the great stuff. So we managed to hook up with the Jays and in the Jays, it was Marlon Williams, uh, Jimmy Johnson and Michael Gilbert. So now Michael Gilbert was on the bass, Jimmy Johnson was on the sax, and Marlon Williams was on the keys. And then he they merged with uh, my band was called the Mystics, mm -hmm. uh, which consisted of uh, myself, Lionel Richie, and William King, and uh, Andre Callahan. So <clears throat> now the task became can we convince Lionel's grandparents? Because the summer has come around now and we were trying to stick together doing, you know, for the summer. And we, so we had to convince Lionel's grandparents and his parents to let him play in the band because he was gonna be going back to Joliet, Illinois to work in the bomb factory with his dad, which was gonna be a summer job. And so, that was kind of challenging because, you know, Grandmother Foster, you know, she wasn't taking any wood and nickels, you know. <laughs> it's like, okay. Uh, but we, the thing was, we're not going to be doing any drugs. We're not going to be playing, in, you know, in any rowdy clubs. So we're going to try to just basically stay clean and do, you know, colleges and, you know, try to do corporate dates and that kind of stuff. And so anyway, we convinced her and she says, okay, you know, um, you're gonna let him, let him play with us. So we're headed to New York now. We saved up enough money. Um, the Jays had this one van that, you know, they had purchased and, you know, it was an older van, but we had enough money for like maybe to get to New York, we thought. However, when we got to the New Jersey Turnpike, we ran out of money. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to borrow money to get into Jersey and to New York. Um, the gentleman at the toll booth, he's, you know, he looked in the, in the van, he says, you know what, I believe you guys. He says, because if you had some money, you would have at least rented a, a trailer because you know, I see seven guys in here, you know, with all the equipment and your luggage and everything, you know, <laughs> it's like, so he let us through. And when we got to the city, uh, I had relatives there, Lionel had relatives there, and Marlon had relatives there, but we didn't want to stay with our relatives. We wanted to, you know, we're going to make it. We're going to take New York by storm, man. We're not, you know. So, we, uh, Thomas, you guys are all, what, about 20? No, we were like uh, 19. 19. And so um, we get in the city and we think, Hmm. The collegiate thing to do is to maybe go to the YMCA and talk to the manager there and see can we, you know, do some work for a uh, room or something, you know, exchange. Uh, uh, so as we went in to talk to the guy, we asked a couple of guys to watch our equipment while we went inside. And they were fascinated at the tall buildings and everything, we were looking up at the buildings and all this stuff. And when we came outside, I someone Stevie Wonder saw all our equipment. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's like Stevie Wonder living for the city. Yeah, man. <laughs> In fact, uh, this particular scene was used in the movie Thank God It's Friday. Uh -huh. And of course, they used this story and the whole script. And in fact, we got a role in the movie as well with Donna Summer, you know, and uh, Too Hot to Trot was a song that I wrote for that movie and for the soundtrack and all, but I was just getting a little ahead of the story. But that's that was our initial introduction to New York. And as we were, <clears throat> now we are in New York, no equipment, no money. 
so we hear about this. Um, we had heard about a nightclub called um, Small's Paradise. Wilt Chamberlain uh, owned it. And um, that's where a lot of the celeb celebrities would come and hang out. You know, it opened from 10 to 4 o'clock in the morning, you know. And um, so we go there in hopes of um, just trying to see what we can make something happen, uh, maybe get to uh, audition there or something, you know. So we're standing outside, and here come the guy who stole our equipment now trying to sell it. <laughs> He's like, hey, anybody want to buy it? I mean, we had our uniforms and everything with the cleaning tags on it and everything. He's like, man, that's our stuff. So we were going to maybe try and take our stuff back. And so the gentleman that was working there at Smalls out front, he says, hey, man, you guys are going to get hurt. Don't do that. Give the guy $50 and he'll give you your stuff back. We said, but we don't have 50 bucks. <laughs> He winds up loaning us the 50 bucks, getting us to audition in Smalls. We um, tore the house down and we got to play there for the rest of the summer. This gentleman became our manager and that was the beginning of, of um, a, 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 a really, really ride that would be a, an incredible journey. What, what was his name? Benjamin Ashburn. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Where there's a will, there's a way, you know? Yeah, and of course, Benny Ashburn was a, was a good friend of Suzanne DePass. He grew up with Suzanne DePass. And uh, Suzanne DePass had just gotten, she was the agent that was booking all the gigs at the Cheater and some of the, clubs in New York there, another club in the village called the Dome. And Barry Gordy had heard about her. So he was just moving out to Los Angeles. So he invited Suzanne out to Los Angeles to head a new division that he was starting and it was called the creative department. And um, at that time, it wasn't artist relations. They changed it to artist relations in our but her first assignment was the Jackson Five, and they had just been on Ed Sullivan, and they were just uh, ready to tour uh, a major national tour of the states, and they were looking for an opening act. And so she called her good buddy Benny Ashbury and her friend, and asked him if he wanted to uh, submit uh, his group to an audition for that slot, and. Um, we did. We uh, was at Lost Price Tur Turntable. It's where the audition took place on 52nd and Broadway. And uh, we um, obviously we won we won the audition, and and it was um, the 52 uh, cities around the, the, the United States. Um, and it gave us incredible exposure. And after we toured for two years with them, uh, Barry Gordon says, hey, are these guys not signed? And we were um, um, awarded a contract with Motown, and, you know, from just the momentum and the write-ups and stuff that we had gotten from our live performances. Now, we we didn't have any hit songs, obviously. We were playing at that time, our repertoire now was, we would do Three Dog Night songs, uh, you know, Liar, we would do a James Taylor song, You Got a Friend, with, you know, we would do a Glenn Campbell, Wichita Lyman. That was our three times a lady, by the way. <laughs> it was a big hit for us. We would do uh, Sly Stone, you know, uh, James Brown, but we would, what I call, commodorize the songs, which meant putting our own twist to it. Mm -hmm. And so here now you have white audiences who could identify with, you know, uh, your James Taylors and your Glenn Cameras and your Three All Nights, 
And then, of course, we, we were introducing uh, African American audiences to those same artists. And of course, they knew the James Brown songs and the Sly Stone songs. So now, all of a sudden, now we are appealing to a crossover market even before we started uh, recording and before we started writing. Mm -hmm. And now uh, that we've gotten this contract with Motown, um, we respected the system that they had. We respected the machine that Barry had assembled. However, we didn't want to use the uh, system. And that, it, that was, he had, you know, songwriters and producers and musicians that would go in and they would, you know, write the songs, produce the tracks, and then he would have the artists come in and just sing on top of the tracks. They had like an assembly line. Yeah, it was a assembly line, exactly. And uh, and so everybody was like shocked. Um, in fact, um, Ray Parker Jr. and some of these musicians, they they had cut some of these tracks, and we was like, they you know that's all that's good, but it's not us. And so we for two years refused to activate our contract, which was unheard of. Most uh, most artists, you know, you get a contract, you can't wait to, oh, go in the studio and let's record, you know. But our concept was we knew we were spending our money um, because, you know, it had to be um, uh, recouped. And we weren't ready to activate uh, the contract for that reason uh, and spend money on tracks that we just weren't feeling. And did, did everyone in the band see eye to eye with that? Oh, yes. Yeah. And it was, it was very powerful because uh, we literally uh, would come out and they would uh, introduce us to various producers and, you know, tracks and we would listen to them and go back to Tuskegee. <laughs> it was like, man, we can't believe these guys are doing this. <laughs> so finally, Barry Gordon said, you know what? These guys are pretty serious about doing it their way. Leave them alone. The worst case scenario, it would just be a write-off, a tax write-off, and but leave them alone. So we went in and so it was now we knew technically, though, that we still needed to um, come up to par as far as, you know, getting the, the right engineer and the right arranger and the right, you know. So we, 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 we did our homework. We did some due diligence. And we saw this gentleman, James Carmichael, who, who appeared on a lot of his credits as an arranger. And he had arranged for... Oh man, everybody a Motown. And he was from Alabama and Gatson, Alabama, and, and we met him. And you know, so chemistry wise, we just kind of, you know, just it was Jeff. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was like, man, this guy, you know, he understands what we're we're trying to accomplish, but he doesn't necessarily understand our uh, our, our, our sound and what we're trying to develop, but at least he understands the direction that we're trying to go. We're trying to, you know, we're trying to do something innovative. We want to be, we're trying to do, you know, a trajectory where we can bring uh, unique melodies and unique chord progressions together and with different kind of rhythms. And, and so that it could uh, be appealing to not only um, an R&B audience, uh, but a crossover, you know, pop, you know, and that, um, and so there we went into the woodshed and it was, it was fun. It was, he taught us how to arrange and how to um, commercialize our ideas in a way that was just 
I mean, it was, um, it, it, it changed our whole um, perception of, of how we were gonna uh, approach our music, you know, and systematically. And, um, but he would be the first to tell you, he said, now I don't understand, quite understand what y'all are doing. He says, but uh, I'll just be a fly on the wall and say, okay, gentlemen, now this right here could be best, you know, uh, presented if if you did it like this, you know. How much, how much older was he than you guys? James Carmichael, um, he was maybe five years older, you know, but he had the wisdom and um, to still, um, uh, like he had the wisdom of, of a maybe, you know, 70 year old man, but he was, he was young at heart, which made it great, you know. So you guys went in and um, you eventually turned out Machine Gun, right? That's right. Yeah. In fact, yeah, that was, you had great success right out of the gate, pretty much, at least it seems that way. Yeah, we were the Machine Gun album was the first uh, gold album in the history of Motown Records. Hmm. Motown had never sold a gold album until that time. They had gold 45s, plenty of them. You can wear, win some bar bets with that. <laughs> oh, yes. yes. In fact, that was the that was the thing that really gave us leverage, you know, and on renegotiating our contract. Cause we had a one contract deal, a one album deal with an option for them to pick that option up. And uh, after that first album went gold, we said, hey, we're out of here. <laughs> and Mr. Gordy went like, wait a minute, not so fast. What do you mean? <laughs> uh, we said, well, you know, CBS, we got, you know, some other labels that are interested. And obviously, um, he his thing was, okay, what is it going to take to keep you guys here? Ah, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> we have got to participate in our publishing. Mm -hmm. So we were the first act in the history of Motown to get our publishing rights. And Stevie Wonder had a and had a really shrewd lawyer who had uh, in his contract what was called a favorite nation clause, um, which allowed him to get whatever was the highest deal and you know, on the label, he was bumped up to it as a result of us getting ours. So as a result of us getting our publishing, Stevie got his, Marvin Gaye, Norma Whitfield, uh, you know. Well, so They must have liked you guys. Yeah, yeah, we, we, uh, <laughs> yeah. Wow. So that was 1974, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the title track was a hit. It also had the bump. Um, Young Girls Are My Weakness, The Zoo. Yeah. Um, man, that's an impressive debut. Thank you. Yeah, that was, uh, in fact, on that one album, we did, become the Black Beatles in the Philippines. We broke the Beatles attendance record at the Iron Nana Coliseum um, in 1975. And it was, um, Ferdinand Marcos was the president at that time. And uh, he sent the military to escort us from the airport because the crowd was enormous. And uh, as we were coming from the airport to our hotel, we heard this gentleman in the balcony, you know, yelling, hey, who are you guys? I'm the greatest. Who are you guys? <laughs> <laughs> that was Muhammad Ali. <laughs> Gotta be. Because huh? wow. <laughs> we, weren't, we, weren't, we weren't big in the States at that time, with, you know, not to, not to, uh, to uh, draw 274,000 people, mm. you know. But um, that album took off. I mean, it was the biggest selling album in the history of Nigeria, uh, a lot of other, a lot of countries around the world. And the title track, which is instrumental, has gone on to be in so many films and. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's yeah. a song that keeps on giving. <laughs> it does, man. It does.
And the strategy, uh, and uh, you know, thanks to Carmichael, James Carmichael too. The strategy was now remember, now, okay, Michael Gilbert. Uh, I'm going back a little bit, you know, um, before the um, Jackson Five tour. Michael Gilbert on the bass was our lead singer. So when he got drafted to the Vietnam War, um, I overheard Lionel singing in the shower one time, and I went, man, you could sing. <laughs> but, of course, he wasn't really confident about it. And But then as he started to sing and get the reaction from the audience, his confidence, be, you know, um, became um, – more embedded in, in 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 everything and of course so and walter lawrence who replaced um andre callahan because andre callahan volunteered for the navy mm. so at that time walter was a drummer that sang lead and played the drums and so that attribute was one of the things that attracted uh Lionel and I to him and of course we recruited him to replace Andre Callahan. However, when we got to the first recording, um, James Carmichael was, was like, okay, it hadn't really been decided strategically whether we had a real lead singer or not. And so, his thing was, okay, you know what, guys? If we come out with an instrumental, it'll give us a chance to kind of test the waters, you know, between Walter Orange and Lionel and to see how we can, you know, get a feel for what the audience may be uh, attracted to as far as our lead. And um, we can take it from there. So that strategy was, it panned out because machine gun, and then and his thing was, if it doesn't hit, then you don't blow your opportunity to come back, you know, with a first impression that with a vocal song, you know? And so um, we thought that was a good strategy. And, yeah, it's, uh, it's, hard, it's, it's hard to be a lead vocalist being behind the drums, I mean, when you're when you're really trying to get a crowd going and yeah 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 so um, the next record caught in the act in '75, uh, which again is where I got on board. Um, I heard Machine Gun, but I wasn't. It was sort of in the periphery for me because mm -hmm. I was young. Um, yeah. But you know, as soon as I heard that hypnotic riff of uh, "Slippery When Wet" um, and that the the beat you know you have that like that bzz, bzz, that kind of yeah, yeah. Beat that I I was yeah. saying it was it reminded me of like a heart being grabbed or something you know uh, yeah and it stopped in your tracks um, so you know, let's talk about that as a lead into this record because I mean the whole album you guys definitely stepped it up considerably from the debut I mean caught in the act is just great through and through well thank you. Um, well, we wanted to, um, when I, obviously, when I thought about Jimi Hendrix and Sly Stone, um, I said to myself, what if Jimi Hendrix and Sly Stone was in the same band? Mm -hmm. You know, um, Jimi's guitar tones was something that everybody just, you know, slobbered at the mouth at, you know. And I thought if I could get a tone that's not just straight up R&B, but that has a slight distorted tone to it, but had the bite of a sly stone with that funk that sly managed to, to get, you know, with higher and all of the, uh, thank you for letting me be myself, all these, you know, that, I mean, that fire, you know, um, so as I played and tossed that around in my mind, uh, uh, I, I finally got the tone that I was looking for. 
And then I thought about um, now it has to be that burning riff that just just jumps out there and grabs you by 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 your by your collar, you know, that says, "Oh man, this is fire!" You know, this is this is uh, energy, you know. And of course, I was um, I was writing down. Um, I think I was up on Mahon Drive, and you know, you see those signs, "Slippery when wet," mm -hmm. and I was like, "Man, slippery when wet that that would be a great song title," you know. <laughs> and uh, of course, um, just just trying to um, now bring lyrically the concept of how can you tie it in with a, a story that you know can invite. Um, people in, you know, and so we, um, and of course, um, this is your life. Um, was just a, 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 a just a just an incredible um, melodic song, but that still grooved and had, you know, um, a message that um spoke to the hearts and the souls of people and um so it was a way now of us all of a sudden saying hey you know not only can we be funky we've shown you that with machine gun and you know the bump and i feel sanctified on the first record and now lyrically you know we can you know be kind of you know a little slick a little bit with slippery and wet to make you think a little bit yeah right the double entendres yeah yeah <laughs> and then of course this is your life we can really slam it and, and brought to, and bring it to church too that's yeah. it bring it to church you know um and and lionel just killed the vocals too oh I mean, he killed it he i mean absolutely killed it <laughs> Yes, he did. <laughs> did. Did did he tend to get it in in a you know like in the first take or two, or did it take a lot of work? Well, that was what was so amazing about it. Um, portions of it was just a, a take or two, and then once he kind of got the character down and saw where it was going, it you know um, there you know, toward the end of the song, you know, was a more um, of James Carmichael directing us into, okay, now we gotta, you, you, you set them up now, you gotta really give them some serious, some ser a serious message here. So um, that took a little, a little more, you know, time and a little more takes, but, uh just that oh man that character that was uh that was that you know was introduced in the, in the beginning of it he did that just like one or two takes that was like you know and whose idea was it to do that sort of unique kind of pulsing beat rhythm part of it so well let's see that's the part when you look at um uh those days of of going back before we started recording and how we would commodorize those songs from the top 40 um that's we we that's when we dove into that part of our creativity and saying you know what uh all right yeah, this could be just a regular ballad like everybody else's ballads, but we don't want to do that. You know, how can we make this different? How can we make this um, uh, still have the same kind of melodic feel and attraction, but energy in the music? And so um, I've been told that. Um, my contributions have been very significant in, in terms of that signature sound. Yeah. So, um, 
in fact, in the book, I talk about that, how, um, how you know, we, uh, how I created the signature sound. Uh, um, and in the next album, you know, you would notice like in Sweet Love, for instance, uh, the Moving On album. Um, here again, you have what could easily have been just a ballad. You know, show me a river that's so deep. Show me a yeah. But when you put that, those uh, syncopated rhythms with that, now you got something different. You got you got a a, a larger, a, yes, and you got those horn punctuations. Yes, yeah, yeah. and um, even the horns had. A unique flavor, kind of like the way War did, you know, not quite the same kind of horn sound as a lot of the other bands. That's exactly right. Um, were you, uh, I want to talk about moving on a little more, but um, were you guys, you know, you talked about having mass appeal. Were you a little disappointed that Slippery When Wet did become a bigger pop hit at that time? Very much so. And we sort of blame the record label, you know, for. Um, not um, because everything has to be marketed, obviously, and promoted, you know. And um, the record label was still sort of, I guess they they were still kind of like, mm, okay, we know these guys have, you know, they they come out and they the first gold album, um, but they weren't so sure as to how to market us, you know, and pop wise, excuse me. And, um, and, 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 and so as a result of that, um, you know, we, I, 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 when I look back at it, I think we, we uh, probably lost some momentum as a result of that because yeah, I went to number one on RB, but I mean, come on, you know, there's a whole nother, <laughs> You know, there's um Yeah, I felt I felt disappointed for you guys. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and to me, I don't know how you feel about it, but I thought it uh that and maybe I feel sanctified uh really influenced like play that funky music by Wild Cherry. Oh no question. And, and then that became this gigantic hit. Yes, that's you exactly know? right. In fact, when we met those guys, that was the first thing they told us. Man, you know, uh the slippery when wet was a definite influence of play that funky music, and of course, uh, you know, <clears throat> what can you say? <laughs> and I'm yeah. glad that it at least influenced others to, um, to you know, to want to go in that vein, you know. 